Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Ariel Bar Tzedok here from the Kosher Torah School, found online at www.koshertorah.com. It is now the beginning, a beginning, a new beginning, a new beginning, which is an old beginning. Now, what am I mumbling about here? I want to take us back, back to some basics, basics that I taught many, many years ago in both audio form, which is no longer available, and even in written form. I want to take you back into something that I wrote. This is a compilation of stuff. This is an ebook of mine called Secrets of Eliyahu Hanavi. You'll see that in, uh, in the little text there, there's a link to being able to acquire the ebook. E I want to start a series of lessons now, where in which we're going to put together the best of everything that we do here at our Kosher Torah School. We're going to get into our experiential, prophetic, Kabbalistic teachings and put it into a biblical context. Put it into? That's kind of like backwards. Simply because our prophetic teachings come out of the biblical context. So essentially, like when I said, babbling away, we're going back to the beginning. We're going to go back to the Bible. I want to start... And we're not going to be able to do this, obviously, in one class, but however many classes it takes us. Bible. Book of Kings, 1 Kings, starting with chapter 17. And again, the secrets of Eliyahu and Avi here, I cover the secrets of Elijah. But in our audio classes that I'm starting now, I want to talk more about Elijah and about Elisha. Now, as you've seen how I've uh, describe this class. I refer to Elisha and Eliyahu as being super psychics. We all know what it means to be psychic. These guys were super psychic. There is a mythology, a misunderstanding of the Bible and biblical stories that have unfortunately, you know, traveled through the centuries giving us many, many false understandings of what the, the, the Bible itself is, what the stories are, and what the real message in the biblical teachings are. And again, I've addressed these things, but they really need to be addressed again. And the wise words of a coded, strange name that we find in Perkei Avot. All right? We have names like ben hey hey and Ben Gag Gag, which is kind of like weird names. He says, Flip it over once, flip it over again, for everything is in it. For those of you who know, I am teaching at this period of time my daily mini classes in the Sefer Yetzirah. At present, at the time of this recording, I am recording in the fourth chapter of the Sefer Yetzirah, and today just concluded Lesson 63, Sag, only, you know, Gematria name there. My point in referencing this is that through that text, I am of a launching pad, if you will, a board from which I can jump off of to discuss very profound understandings in our Torah tradition. This is in complement to what the Bible teaches. And essentially, the Bible is the source of these things. When we come to biblical stories, for the most part, we read them almost like with, you know, our hands over our eyes. There are so many fundamental teachings, profound teachings, that we really need to understand to get an accurate and correct understanding of Tanakh. And you might ask, well, that's ancient history. Who cares? Well, if you want to understand Torah correctly, what authentic Torah Judaism is, you want to understand that correctly, well, then you need to understand the foundations from where it all comes from. We need to look back at the stories of people like Eliyahu Hanavi, and Elisha, who came after him. And we are going to see, oh, I know you don't like this word when I use it with the Bible, but too bad. We are going to see 
a very overt and inexcusable, un, you know, un, un, unmissable, there's no word like unmissable, uh, whatever, extraterrestrial presence in the Bible itself. Now, I know many of you think, when you think of the word extraterrestrial, you think of little gray guys and flying saucers shooting around Roswell, New Mexico with the, like, the little ray guns zapping people. Okay, we can dispel with the fantasy and the mythologies. We need to understand that which we call spiritual reality and that which we call extraterrestrial reality, pretty much one and the same. Now, how can I make such a statement? I've been asked that often. And the answer is very simple. Well, we're going to talk about God and we're going to talk about angels and of course later with Elijah the prophet we're going to talk about chariots of and horses of fire and all kinds of weird stuff and you gotta remember these things are not of this earth they're alive I think yeah God angels yeah okay we accept that they're real but they're not of this earth therefore they are not terrestrial and if they are not terrestrial that makes them by definition extraterrestrial. Now, we've heard me say this a dozen times or more. This should be nothing new for my regular listeners. But now, I want to go into the biblical stories themselves. And let's review it line by line, point by point, and have that proverbial moment where we're stroking our beard, whether you have one or not, going, hmm, yeah, what's going on there? Because this will enable us to speculate deeply into the true nature of the true message. And that true message of the Torah, the Bible, Judaism, is we are definitely not alone. And we are definitely not, shall we say, completely in charge. Take a look around what's happening in our world today. We are facing a hopefully the, the, the slowing down, but still presence of a global pandemic. We have all types of social unrest uh, affecting the United States at present and all kinds of weird stuff going on around the world. Are you actually going to just sit there and say, shrug your shoulder, yeah, these things happen. It's all a coincidence, right? Or are you going to start looking and saying, gee whiz, why are all these things happening one after another, boom, 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 boom. Hmm. Is there a pattern here? Is there a message here? Is there something else going on? No. I really do not think the little aliens, remember the guys, you know, the little gray guys, the flying saucer with the ray guns? No, I don't think they infected us with COVID-19. So let's, let's, let's dispel the mythologies, please. Okay, no, they're not mind controlling the people causing violence throughout the United States right now. Let's dispel the mythologies, please. And all the conspiracy theories, this is going on here, that's going on there. Come on, come on, come on, please. Can we get realistic? When we talk about Torah, we talk about freedom. Freedom is not anarchy. Freedom is responsibility. Which, who, was it Spider-Man or Superman? I forgot which one that said, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, it's kind of true. When you experience and know the truth, all right, you'll forgive me for, for quoting Yeshu, the truth does set you free. Free of what? Free of lies. Free of deception. You might not be able to fathom the truth of everything going on, You'll, as they say, smell it. You'll be able to watch the news and say, you know, something something else is going on. I might not know what it is, but something else is going on. Now, how do we stop from becoming conspiratorial? They're planning to chip us. They're planning to get us. They're planning to do this and that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, slow down. Rational analysis is the best way to dispel conspiracy theories. Understanding the Bible correctly 
is rational analysis. And then when we follow the prophetic path, which cultivates within us a psychic intuitiveness, then you have an inner meter, an internal thermometer, barometer, magnet, call it whatever metaphor by whatever you wish, that's going to give you a sense of knowing, ah, it's not going to conclude for you conspiracy nonsenses, but it's going to give you a sense of experience to know and understand a greater reality around us. So now, with that foundation, let's just jump right in to 1 Kings chapter 17. And we're going to read about Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. Starting with verse 1, and I quote, And Elijah the Tishbite of the settlers of Gilead. Okay, even before we talk about what he is saying, who is this guy? This is really weird. Because when you go look, and all, most of the other people introduced throughout the Bible, they always identify them within the context of their families. So Moshe, remember Moshe Rabbeinu, he is Ben Amram, right? When we talk about Shmuel, the famous Samuel the prophet, we know who his parents are. When we're talking about David or Shlomo or anybody everywhere, Isaiah, Ezekiel, we know who all these guys are. We know their parentage. We know their tribes. We know something about their families. Well, can you tell me about Elijah's family? What's the name of his father? It's curious. My translation, which is, uh, it's the traditional Jewish translation. They say, Elijah the Tishbite of the settlers of Gilad. Okay, but it's curious because that word tish by Tishbi in Hebrew, Eliyahu ha Tishbi, and he is of the settlers, which the Hebrew word is Tishbi. He is a Tishbi who's a Tishbi. <laughs> Wait a second, it's the same word. What does it mean? Elijah, who is a Tishbite of the Tishbites of Gilead, or he's a settler of the settlers of Gilad. You scratch your head and you go, whoa, 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 what does that mean? Oh, well, wait a second. Okay, Tishbi. Oh, okay. You know what that means? Tishbite. He comes from the town of Tishbi. Really? There is no town of Tishbi. Go look through all biblical archaeology, all of the history of ancient Israel. There's no such town ever, no such area ever by that name or that would meet that identity. So he is a Tishvi. What is a Tishvi? Again, really it translates it clearly as a settler, Toshav. Toshav means someone who dwells there. So Eliyahu is a dweller and he dwells or he comes from the dwellers of Gilad. Now you're might be as curious as I am to say, well, really, what does that mean? Where does he come from? Who is he? What is he? Well, that is a very good question. And we do not have an answer. This has, of course, led to numerous millennia of all types of uh, speculation that Eliyahu was none other than an angel who comes down to earth in human form. And as we know from later, you know, 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah goes to heaven in a chariot of fire. I'll, we'll deal with the chariot of fire later when we get to it. But he never dies. So here's the question. Was he ever born? If I could say like Enoch. Remember Enoch? Who is Enoch's father? All right, we call him Enoch Ben, son of Yahweh. We know his dad. We know his grandpa. We know his kids. So Enoch is a known entity to us, even though he's taken up. But Eliyahu, where does he come from? 
We know he's taken up. But now the question is, where does he come from? Don't I, I, I don't have an answer for you. The answer does not exist. All we have is speculation. Now, granted, we can go into the correlation. This is where I'm taking you right now of later literature, because as we know, Enoch ascended and was absorbed, didn't become the isolated, but was absorbed into a race of beings called the Metatron. The Metatron, based upon understandings from the Emek HaMelech of Rabbi Bacharach, which came many, many uh, centuries, well, centuries ago from us, but centuries after the, the beginning of the story. The Metatron are, if you will, the souls of the Adamic race that never came down to earth, and therefore, in quote, never fell. So uh, Enoch became the conduit and the bridge between those who never fell to those who did. He was the first to be restored. So that's why he was absorbed into the Metatron. But now we have Eliyahu. Eliyahu is also said to be a specific type of an, I hate to use the word angel because it doesn't mean anything. And I don't like to use the Hebrew word malach for angel because it means messenger. Now, if you come over to my house and I ask you to go to the store for me to buy, you know, a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk, you are my messenger. You are my malach. That doesn't make you an angel. I said, <laughs> not that easy. No. So when we refer to these entities, as you know, in Hebrew, we have all kinds of very strange, bizarre names, which are elaborated in the literature over time. Again, from Ezekiel's chariot, you know, we have the, the Hayot, the Kirovim, the Kirovim we know from the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you have Hashmal, you have the Ishim, you have all these weird Seraphim that Isaiah saw, or, or, or you know, the, the dragons, the Teli. You have all this kinds of stuff. Who are all these guys? And what do they have to do with Eliyahu? Well, Eliyahu is said to be of a specific type of a other race. I'll, I'll just for a moment say angelic race. And they say that he is an Ophan of the wheels. And they get into all the Kabbalistic details of this and that. But essentially, Eliyahu becomes or originally was an angel called Sandalphon. Sandalphon, you know, I, I, I'm not very familiar with a lot of pop, modern, uh, like entertainment and so and, and on television and stuff like that. But I've heard that there have actually been recent television programs where in which they've had uh, characters incorporating the uh, biblical or later angelic entities and that they've actually had characters in these TV shows or something like that where one is portraying Metatron, one is portraying Sandalfon and all. <laughs> okay. I bring this up for you so that your mind will not go into that direction and making associations. So just in case it's out there and you guys know something about these stuff that I don't, just so we know. But anyway, Sandalfon is said to be one of the two Kirovim, the two cherubs, who was on the Ark of the Covenant alongside Metatron. And it was said that they are sister souls, actually soulmates, Metatron, Sandalphon, and that they are the male and female polarity entities and energies, which become what we call the Merkaba, the throne of God. In other words, how the conduit of the divine materializes here below. Now, this is interesting. I see Eliyahu Navi. I got a whole chapter, a couple chapters of, of him right in the Bible. I know what he's going to do. If anybody is in quote a vehicle through which God acts, it's certainly Eliyahu. All right, we know the stories. You don't need me to elaborate them right now. Enoch, Metatron. All right, I know how the Christians want to think that Enoch Metatron became Yeshu. Go online to my YouTube page, check it, and kosher.com has the same essay 
Kod should be Mashiach. And when you look at the logic of it in light of Christian theology, you have to conclude, come on, it, it's just not realistic. It's not possible. But I'm not going to get into arguments and debates about Christianity when we're talking about Eliyahu, right? Metatron's another story. But Eliyahu's there. The Ark of the Covenant, the Kirovim, are said to be the active throne. Metatron is above. Sandalfon is below. Male, female. In Kabbalah speak or Sephirot, you have the Teferet and the Malchut. So Eliyahu is supposed to be like the Malchut. Eliyahu is the big and famous fancy Navi. If you remember from the book of Malachi, Hine Anochi Sholeach Lechem. Behold, I send to you et Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu comes back. Lifne ba Yom Hashem Hagadol Vahanora before the great and awesome day. Eliyahu comes back. What is his job? The job of Eliyahu is make peace. Try to get the children to go back to their fathers and the spirit of the fathers to be imbued in the children. <laughs> That's a big job, especially today. God bless Eliyahu whenever he comes. Good luck. But he comes. What form will he take? That is a good question. Right now, here he is. <sighs> what form is Eliyahu right now? If you were to close your eyes and to imagine to me what Eliyahu and Abi look like, I'll bet you this is what you're going to think. He's an old guy, long white beard, right? Maybe some fluffy white hair. He's wearing a robe, right? And it looks like something out of a Hollywood movie. <laughs> Where does it say that Eliyahu was an old man? How do you know he wasn't a young man? You think he has a long white rabbi's beard. Maybe he had a short black beard. Maybe he was an old, frail man. Maybe he was a young, robust, tough guy with big muscles. How do you know? You don't know, do you? Eliyahu comes out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, he's on the scene. But remember, as it will become very clear, he is not a nobody. Everybody knew who Eliyahu was. He just pops into the story, and here he is talking to, interacting with, the king of the northern kingdom, Israel. Now, for any of you who know anything about politics, no one gets close to the leader of a nation <laughs> unless you have access. Remember Moses? You think just Moses just strut, you know, walked right in on Pharaoh, la di da? What do you think the, the, the uh, secret service of Pharaoh's court did about that? You don't just walk in on the king. The king is surrounded by an army. For Eliyahu to have access to him means that he was a VIP. People knew who he was. It says, he says, Tosha. A dweller. It gives us this curiosity of his origins, which are unknown. Is he an angel who comes down to earth? Do you recognize the ramifications of that? Do you see the significance in that question? You're not going to like it, but you've got to look at it. If Eliyahu is really Sandalphon, and Sandalphon becomes a human on earth, can angels become human, take on bodies of flesh and blood? Yeah, the rabbis and the Kabbalists, they talk about that. That's fine. Okay, that's not an issue. But that would say Eliyahu is not really human, is he? Which means that he wouldn't be terrestrial, which means that, oh, it's that dirty word again. He would be an extraterrestrial. Now, don't you dare go say that. Oh, Rabbi said uh, that, that Eliyahu is an alien. I never said that. And I'm not going to say that. I'm pretty sure Eliyahu was a human being. But I think that this human being is a pretty weird dude who hung around with some pretty strange <laughs> friends. And he had some really weird powers. Now, with this being said, that I have created a cloud, I'm sorry, of question about Eliyahu's origins, because that's all that we have.
His origins are not normal. And this guy is not normal. And his top dog student at least shop is not normal. These guys are out of this world. We take the stories in the book of Kings to be literal. These were not poetic books like Mish uh, Psalms, uh, Ecclesiastes, even a novella like Job. This is meant to be taken real. And as such, I mean, and the way that scholars look at this, we, we recognize it as such. These guys are out of this world. When we want to talk about, and they use terms like super psychic, well, there's our man. If you look today at a lot of the UFO world conspiracies, they will say that the extraterrestrials are all extra, uh, uh, they're telepathic. They communicate with us through telepathy. Uh, if you go look back to the Roswell incident and the alleged writings that came out of that little gray guy, it's all telepathic stuff. Now, from a Torah and Kabbalistic point of view, when we are apprised of these claims, they don't strike us as bizarre or strange or impossible. On the contrary, we say, yeah, that, that sounds about right. That's the way it would be. So Eliyahu, right now, goes to the king Ahab, and he says, Chai Hashem, Elokei Yisrael, Asher Amadati Lifanav. As Hashem, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stood. He stood before God? Is that a symbolic statement? Like you prayed before God, you're in the presence of God, you know, the whole world is full of his glory? Or is it something a little bit more precise? Moses stood in the presence of God when, of course, he received the Ten Commandments. Even though it was a prophetic vision, Isaiah entered into the palace and, you know, the temple and was in the, in quote, presence of God. Is that what Eliyahu is suggesting that he has an experience of this nature, which means that he was off-world in astral and or physical form. Moses was off-world in physical form. El, uh, 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 Isaiah was off-world in astral form. What does this say about Eliyahu? Again, it doesn't. But the question needs to be asked. Because when these words historically were written by its author, remember, these words were written by their authors centuries and centuries, millennia ago, in a culture very different from our own. These were not rationalists, philosophers, or intellectuals writing in that Greco-Roman mentality. These were ancient Semitic authors and they were writing in the ancient Semitic mentality. And they were telling things as they knew it. And they were saying things that meant, well, let me rephrase, they were saying things that had meaning to them that to us today in translation gets completely lost. That's why we need to understand the Bible right. Because when we reestablish the, in quote, legs that we stand upon, then we recognize the truths of what we're dealing with. So Eliyahu says to the king, how he has access to the king, it doesn't say. The king obviously knew who he was. It's not some stranger just popping up. The king says, who's this lunatic popping up next to me? Obviously, the king knew very well who he was. So Eliyahu is a well-established figure with a mysterious past a very mysterious relationship with God. And he says the most profound, provocative, possibly even arrogant statement. And I quote, As the Lord, the God of Israel, and my serve lives, if there will be during these years do or reign, except according to my word. Ki'im lefi divarai. In other words, you ain't going to have rain unless I say so. 
That's the, is it, you don't find that weird? I mean, okay, let's let's make believe a prophet comes today. You and I were prophets now, and we're going to speak for God. God gives us a message, and God says to us, "Go speak to the children of Israel." Put it out on Facebook and, of course, on YouTube, right? And thus saith the Lord, "There shall be no rain until the Lord says so." Isn't isn't that the way we would normally phrase it? Until God says so. God says. There will be no rain. And when God says there will be rain, there will be rain. So if you want there to be rain, what do you do? Well, you pray to God, dear Lord, send rain. You might be familiar with a very famous story in the Gemara of Honi. Honi uh, was one of the great sages in, in, in the days of the Talmud. And they needed rain. He made the magic circle and he stood in the center and he did <laughs> Eliyahu and Abi type stuff. And he said to God, the budget to set until you send the rain. And he was able to coerce certain powers that be, but they sent the rain. Fine. Eliyahu was saying, don't worry about the powers. I'm your source. I don't know. You don't think that's weird? Who ever talked like that? Did Moses ever say to the children of Israel, you uh, will go into the promised land when I'm ready to take you? Did uh, Joshua ever talked like that, right? We'll conquer the land when I'm ready. I, 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 did Ezekiel ever ever see the, you know the chariot and and then say to the people, you know what, God, I'll tell them what I want to tell them. That, <laughs> we consider that to be blasphemous arrogance, and yet this is what Eliyahu says: "Ki'im lefi devarai." It's not going to rain until I say so. Who the heck are you that you? As a human being, have such, well, here, have such what? Power or authority. Now, from one side, we could say that Elijah is the prophet. God gives the prophet the authority to make a proclamation and God will uphold it. That's one way to look at it. So Elijah comes and says, all right, until I say so, because I'm speaking in the name of God, and therefore it's like God said so. That's one way to look at it, okay? But then you would think after three years, once the rain comes, what does Eliyahu do? He should just say, Lord, rain, and bosh. But that's not what happened. We'll get to that when we get to the story. No, Elijah pretty much made Go ahead in the story and you'll see he sets out to pray, sends his servant. Do you see any rain clouds? Nope. Praise again. See any rain clouds? Little one. See any rain clouds? Little bigger. Praise again. Starts to rain. Eliyahu, <coughs> excuse me, created the rain. He made it rain. How did he do that? Because it wouldn't rain unless he said so. Now that's a very interesting power. Is that a human power? Is that possibly an extraterrestrial power? Is that an angelic power? Let's just discuss that for a bit. What the heck does that even mean? Well, what is rain? Okay, you know what? Go study meteorology and how rain comes about. Go Google it and look on, you know, YouTube videos, whatever. It'll tell you, you know, you have to have the moisture in the air, this and that, etc. Can that be humanly manipulated? Well, for those of you who believe in Project HARP, right, which is supposedly a weather modification machine, then the answer would be, but of course, weather can be modified by a human intervention. But this is, what, 3,000 years ago? So, uh, I don't think that uh, Project Harp was uh, functional 3,000 years ago. But if we're dealing with an angelic power, and in quote, these angels who are not of this earth, and remember something about angels. They're not God or gods. They don't operate with magic. If God says to the angels, you're in charge, and the angels want to say, let there be rain or not be rain, do you think the angel just goes with a Harry Potter snap and there's rain, or 
Harry Potter's snap and no ring? Maybe wiggle a nose like Elizabeth Montgomery would do in the old TV show Bewitched and blink your eyes like Jeannie from the old TV show and poof. Okay, I think we're watching too many TV shows if that's the way we associate things happening. Somehow, some way, the meteorological effect was manipulated. Some power, some force got involved. And it was not by magic. Go back, way back, to the parting of the Red Sea. For those of you who have seen the famous Cecil B. DeMille version in the movie, you know, it just sucks the water. Very, very inspirational. Comedic at the same time. But it's totally, totally unbiblical. The Bible says very clearly, a strong hurricane gale force wind Blew against the sea, pushing the waters apart. Okay, that's how God works. So what happened here? What was in operation to affect the meteorological conditions so as to create a famine, to make rain gone? I want you to understand that there was some function of a possible law of nature, which was operated by what we will call a higher force. But let's be blunt. It obviously was a higher technology. When the wind blew against the sea to make the, you know, the sea part at the parting of the Red Sea, something caused that wind. What was the breath of God? Yeah, but okay, God is operational through natural forces, through his angels, his messengers. And when the messengers are fulfilling the function for which their message is, is, is sent out there, how do they do it? Remember, angels aren't gods. They are not magical. They have a function. We, I, we have to use the word a technology, even if it's by definition a spiritual technology. Of their own. We see that with Ezekiel's chariot. Somehow, some way, something about that chariot. It's a vehicle of transportation. Elijah goes up to heaven. How does he go? Do they just open up a vortex and he passes through it? No. He's got chariots and horses of fire. Really? Chariots and horses? What the heck is that all about? I mean, he just can't just, you know, be taken up. He has to go. <laughs> You know, it sounds like something out of Greek mythology. Chariots and horses of fire. You know, it's, it, it, it reminds me of an old uh, uh, scene from one of the old Sons of Hercules' you know, movies from back in the 50s, 60s. So, <laughs> but this is real. Something is happening here. Something is going on here that we're not paying attention to. The ancients understood this. But they didn't have the language and the terminology that we do today to understand it. So when we go back and look at simple words, and all we did in the last half hour was to discuss one single verse and look at all these weird little things in it and say, hmm, now, I know you would love for me to be able to give you answers. Yes, Eliyahu is, 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 is the angel Sandalphone, and uh, he is really uh, the, the head of an extraterrestrial fleet that exists in the fourth dimension that has the flying saucers flying all over the place, and they zap us with this and that. Yada, 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 yada. Okay. If we want to create science fiction, then that's a great story. That's not what the Bible teaches. So please don't say that's what I talk because it's not. But something's going on. There is definitely something going on behind the scenes. And this should not surprise us because we see this theme over and over and over again. When Elisha, later in Kings, when he is, uh, what, what they wanted to take him by the king, I think it was the king of Syria, all right? And his servant is with him and they go, oh my gosh, we're surrounded by the, 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 ar the army of the enemy. And Elisha goes, Shem opened his eyes. And all of a sudden there's this, you know, cavalry of angels surrounding. Where the hell do they come from? What are they? And yet it's something real. 
All right. I'm going to be a little mischievous here. This was not in my intent to discuss at this time. You should know. But these are two stories that I want to share that I heard from a rabbi who was a soldier in the Israeli army who swears to me that this is something that he knew and saw. There are two very bizarre historical facts that happened in the 1973 war. All right. And, uh, and the first one, you know, the war, the Yom Kippur War. On that day, the Syrian army invades Israel from the north. And they were completely successful. There was pretty much no one there in the Golan Heights to resist them. There was a small force there with the Syrians that to those brave soldiers is, 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 is disgusting. But they came completely down off the Golan and they were about to enter into the Galilee. And they could literally have cut the nation of Israel in half. And that would have been the end of the state of Israel. But history documents. All right, go check this out. That's for some reason, that entire Syrian army picked up, turned around, went back to Syria. <laughs> What's going on? Modern military science will say, yes, they were suspecting, they, they were surprised that there was no resistance. They suspected a surprise attack, so they retreated. That sounds kind of dumb. This is the story that was told to me. That later when that military unit was engaged and they were captured and they were interrogated and they got the commanding officer and they said, okay, what the heck did you do? Why, why did you, you know, blow your opportunity? And this is the story that they claim. That as he was coming down the Golan, a cloud appeared over heaven and what came down like a hand and stood in front of their entire military and spoke to them in clear Arabic. That's far enough. You may go no further. And they freaked the blank out of themselves and they fled back up and they said the God of Israel fights for them. True? False? I wasn't there. But that's what they say. 1973. Curious intervention. Just like somebody messing around with weather tech way back in the days of Eliyahu. There's another story from uh, the Sinai. Uh, the Egyptian Third Army uh, surrendered to a much, much smaller uh, Israeli force. And again, the Israelis captured them and it's very curious. They said, why did you surrender? And again, it is alleged by people who were interrogated, in, Ara in other words, Arabic soldiers, Egyptian soldiers, who claimed that they surrendered because they saw the overwhelming number of the Israeli cavalry that had surrounded them. Israeli cavalry? Go, go, go do a little a Google search on that one. Israel doesn't have a cavalry. What, what on earth did these modern day soldiers with mechanized tanks see that caused them such panic that they surrendered their entire force, the entire Egyptian Third Army in the Sinai. Weird stuff. Weird stuff. I cannot confirm for you the historicity of either story. But I can tell you based upon our biblical example, weird stuff still happens. Just like it says in the book of Daniel, that there are those who are called the Irin, the watchers. And it is by their edict and design, as divined by God, of course, that events on earth occur. And that is obviously whom Eliyahu must have been in contact with. These, in quote, watchers didn't just appear in the days of Daniel. And before that, they had a different job. No, they're there, even in these days of Eliyahu. Obviously, based upon an understanding of these verses, Eliyahu must have been in contact with them, must have been in cahoots with them. And who knows, maybe he was actually one of them. Hmm, something to think about. So, that is what we're left with. Now, the story continues. And the word of God comes to Eliyahu. And after Eliyahu makes this profound proclamation, 
Well, what does he do? Well, what would you do? It says, God says to him, go from here, go east, flee the country, pretty much. Hide at a place called the brook called Kirit, uh, which is, it says here, Al Penehayarden, which is on the other side of the Jordan. In essence, God said to Eliyahu, go into hiding. Why would Eliyahu need to go into hiding? Um, think about this. If you were the king of Israel and you had a political opponent who is now imposing economic terrorism on your country, I'm sure that's how Ahab looked at Elijah the prophet. He did not look at Elijah as the champion of the people. He looked at him as the scourge. He looked at him as an enemy. By modern standards, he would have been called a provocateur, a terrorist. So I am certain that in Ahab's eyes, Eliyahu is sabotaging the king, sabotaging the country. El Ahab the king did not say, oh, who's this crazy guy Eliyahu? Oh, there's not going to be any rain? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. You have such power. Yeah, yeah. No, Ahab knew he had the power. So Ahab was very, very upset. He was, you know, P.O. as they say. And if you're the king and you have a, political opponent who has the ability to commit economic terrorism, what would you do? Well, most likely Ahab, if he had the opportunity, would have said to Eliyahu, put a sword to his neck and said, you either bring rain or uh, you either spill the blood, the rain or we'll spill your blood. So God says, knowing well what's the situation, the reality, go into hiding, flee the country. And it says, I'm going to give you this place. This is where you go. You're going to go to the brook, and that's where you're going to drink. And then it says something really weird. Right? And I will command the ravens to feed you there. And verses then says, he went and did as the word of God. And he went, turn my pages here. He went and resided by there, which is before the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And from the brook did he drink. The ravens, the Midrash, you know, which is embellished stories, tells this beautiful story that in order to provoke King Ahab, these birds would land on the royal table every day at breakfast and at dinner and would take meat and bread and fly them to Eliyahu. Isn't that a lovely story? Can you see through the facade of that story? Think about this. How big is a raven? How much food, bread, and meat does a human being need? Now, <laughs> we have a Hebrew word called an istanis. People are very, very sensitive. All right. Can you imagine? Birds start bringing you stuff that's been in their beaks for hours. You're going to eat that? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> God only knows what's been in that bird's mouth. And I'm going to eat it? I don't think so. That's a funny story. And think about it again, the rationality here. If every single day you had birds landing on your table and they're taking, you know, how much does a man eat? Okay, uh, what do you think he's taking, like little crumbs, little itsy bitsy pieces? I mean, you know, this, this is breakfast, this is dinner, you gotta eat. At least a few slices of bread, if not a loaf, meat, a, 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 a significant portion. So if all of a sudden you have birds that land on your table, shoot, 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 and they take a loaf of bread, and they take a lamb chop, all right? And you see it happen once, eh. Then it happens again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Don't you think you might get a little suspicious? I would. And what happens then? You might want to say, hmm, maybe we should follow these birds and see what the heck is going on. And if they're taking it to Eliyahu, well, guess what? Your location is no longer secret because the birds just exposed you. So what good is it having birds <laughs> bring you disgusting food that they're flying for hours to carry, right? Ew. No. I don't think that that was what it meant. 
Halloween, the birds or the ravens, is actually believed to be a code. A secret code of a secret society of underground prophets who were safeguarding their master. Now that makes more sense. Oh, it might sound a little conspiratorial, but in all due respect, secret societies, they're real. Whether we will ascribe to these so-called secret societies, the global conspiracies that we do, that I think it's a, a whole lot more fantasiacal, but secret societies are out there. They've always been out there. You got all kinds of secret societies going on. Why do you think this is a new concept? This has been going down since the day. I mean, the Egyptian priesthood was a secret society. Pythagoras in ancient Greece had a secret society. You don't think that the school of the prophets was uh, the equivalent of a secret society? Of course it was. It still is. Yeah, secret societies, secret Kabbalistic groups like the Nistarim, yeah, they've been out there forever and ever. I mean, people know this stuff. Okay? So now this starts to make sense. God says, go into hiding. You're going to go by this place. That's where you get your water and food. I'll send my boys. They'll provide for you meat and bread in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. So we learn two things here from Eliyahu Hanavi. Number one, he was not vegetarian. <laughs> what can I say? The great and holy prophet who spoke to God had all this power, an incarnate angel, an angel of flesh and blood, was a carnivore, and he had bread. So bread and meat. What do we call that today? Think about it. A hamburger. <laughs> a hot dog. Eliyahu ate junk food. <laughs> That's pretty much the biblical equivalent of what he had. Hamburgers and hot dogs. Hot dogs and hamburgers. That's the way it was. And that is what he ate. Now, we learn from this, obviously, the reality of the existence of our secret society and an essence or an element about diet. People especially today, like to associate the idea of vegetarianism with a higher level of spirituality. I have always fundamentally disagreed with that. Now, myself, I personally have never been the biggest fan of red meat. All right, I don't eat it. I don't miss it. I will eat chicken and poultry. But my contention today, why I don't eat meat, is more so based upon the laws of kashrut, in that there are specific uh, levels of consciousness, if you will, or kavanot, that the person who performs the shechita, the slaughtering, is required to have at the time of the slaughtering, which I don't see in, in, in modern day people. And being that for me, everything is energy, I don't look at any meat today as meeting that standard unless maybe a friend of mine or I myself would slaughter it. And yeah, I do have that in my shechita and I actually right here at my desk. So in okay, case so I don't have any chickens running through my office, I have something to eat for Shabbat. But that being aside, I am certain that in the days of Eliyahu, that the meat that they brought him didn't come from the table of King Ahab. King Ahab was an idol worshiper. I don't think he kept kosher. You think that uh, uh, he's that Elijah's going to eat the meat from his table? I don't think so. It's a lovely story, but obviously without any historicity once we put it to the light of scrutiny. But something was there. And what we learn from this is a lesson in practicality. Right now in pandemic times, there was a major issue between members of the religious faiths, not just Jewish, and members of the scientific community. Scientific community people were saying, you got to take the dangers of this pandemic seriously. You have to have social separation and all the rest of this stuff. 
or people can get infected and people can die. People of religious faith were saying, ah, we don't care, God will protect us, everything will be well. Well, everything wasn't well. People got sick and people died. Until finally members of the religious leadership, not just Jewish, Christian and others, said, you know what? We've got to listen. They had to be real. They had to be practical. Eliyahu is real and practical. We learn from him that if the king of Israel is out to get you, you don't just stand there and thump your chest and say, you know something? I'm going to send down a lightning bolt. I'm going to show you. I'm Superman. Go ahead, shoot your bullets and watch them bounce off my chest. I'm faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and I'm able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Well, that's great if you are a television character of Superman. But Eliyahu is not Superman. Oh, he is definitely a super psychic. He has powers and abilities far beyond that of mortal men indeed. But avoiding assassins is not one of them. So even God himself says, in the real world, you have to be practical. Even if you are a super psychic. Your super psychic abilities does give you powers. Oh yes, it does. But there's a limit even to that. And that's a very humbling and important message. When we practice the prophetic traditions today and we make a sense and we make connections with them, whoever they are, and have all kinds of revelations and insights and we cultivate psychic abilities and powers. In our Torah tradition, we're not the only ones who do this. In many, many other traditions, such as the Pantanjali traditions, I, they have understandings of these things as well. These things are not done to make an individual a uh, uberman, to make them superior, to conquer the little ants of people. That's disgusting and it's stupid and it's fundamental wrong. That's not what real true spirituality is about. Real true spirituality teaches us to be submissive to God, to be in cahoots with and in union with powers that be to operate the universe and to recognize the laws of nature and to live accordingly. And so, with that note, just as we'll conclude tonight, it comes to pass at the time that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Well, you ran out of water. Well, what do you do? Well, you know, what Eliyahu could have done, I mean, it could have just created a little whirlwind of water and filled the brook up again, right? No... Does it work like that? You're looking for fantasy miracles. And the wise words of our sages in the Torah said, in the Talmud, Ein sumchim alanes. Don't rely on miracles. If you're pushed up against the wall and you have no choice, that's one thing. But we don't live thumping our chest to heaven and defiance of the real world. We don't do that. What does Eliyahu do? Right? The word of the Lord comes. All right? Split. Leave. I want you to go all the way up to the area of Sidon. In there, I'm going to have someone take care of you. And on that note, taking care, that's another story that we will discuss in our next class as we continue in these, in these lessons. But anyway, I discuss a lot of these things, like I said, in my ebook, Secrets of the Prophet Eliyahu. Uh, there's a, a, a connection to that, a link to it, and then, you know, my ebook page. It's a $15 ebook if you're interested. If you do purchase it through our PayPal page, please, please, please put a note saying that it's for the Iliwa Navi book so I know what it's for rather than just nebulous donation. And learn. Keep up with these lessons because we're going to take the highest of all that psychic stuff and the real tangible, practical stuff of this earth I'm going to show you how it all is one true biblical reality. We'll pick it up in our next class. Thank you all for joining me. I'm Ariel Bartzadok, the Kosher Torah School. Looking forward to learning with you next class. I'll see you then.